I thought, oh my gosh, this reminds me of David Neeleman, who's the founder of JetBlue, uh, who's really, I think, the greatest uh, commercial airline entrepreneur in history and a fantastic guy. And uh, everybody said, you know, never invest in an airline. Well, I've now done three airlines with investing with David Neeleman. He's that fantastic. And so I thought, well, with Andy, what he's saying uh, really is so compelling that I said, well, you know what, I'm gonna provide the seed, some of the seed capital for this. So I invested and then another professor uh, matched my investment and then he raised about as much from student friends of his. And that was the original seed capital to get Bonobo, Bonobo's launch. It's time! Work! Play! Evolve! I want to connect the listeners to the best of the best. Welcome to the Evolved Broker Podcast. I'm your host, Pat Costello, the co-founder and principal at Evolve MGA. Our mission for the podcast is to bring the insurance industry the best of the best. My guest today is one of the best business teachers in the world. He attended Harvard Business School and served as CEO of Trammell Crow when it was the largest private commercial real estate development firm in the world. He went on to serve as the chairman of JetBlue Airways for 12 years. His name is Joel Peterson. Joel has launched or backed over 250 companies. Many of these companies are household names like Bonobos, Trunk Club, Asurion, and Vivint. He recently authored a book called Entrepreneurial Leadership. As he says, it's about the art of launching new ventures, inspiring others, and running stuff. Finally, he is a professor at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, teaching classes in leadership, entrepreneurship, and real estate. If you want to be a better leader, build a better business, or be more effective on a daily basis, you will really enjoy this conversation. Joel and I discussed his experience with Trammel Crow, Bonobos, JetBlue, major topics from his book, and more. Today's podcast is sponsored by First Insurance Funding. First is the leading premium finance company in insurance and is known throughout the industry for their personalized service and quote flexibility. If you're tired of sending quote requests for smaller premiums to multiple companies, not leaving enough time to negotiate larger deals, then choose First as your premium financing source and experience the first difference today. Without further ado, here's Joel. Joel, welcome to the Evolved Broker Podcast. Good to be with you, Pat. I really appreciate you spending some time with me today. Frankly, your resume is off the charts. In the intro that we just recorded for you, I probably could have gone for about another 30 minutes. So I have a ton of questions for you, but in the interest of time, I'm hoping that we can go through a couple topics I was brainstorming about when I was thinking about this conversation. The first topic is Trammel Crow. The second one is Bonobos, uh, because I know you have experience with both. Um, learning lessons from your time as chairman of JetBlue. And then major takeaways from your book, entrepreneurial leadership. So if that sounds good to you, I can dive right in. Yeah, I would say the only reason you could go on for another 30 minutes is that I'm very old. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's a lot of ground that's been covered. All right, we'll have to let the audience decide for them, themselves on that. <laughs> um, but that sounds good. In um, When you look back on your time with Trammell Crow, what were some of the best decisions you made? And excuse me, what were some of the best decisions you made when leading the company? And is there anything that you wish that you did differently? Well, we could spend the whole time on that. Uh, the best decision I ever made was to go with Trammell. Um, he was a sole uh, kind of entrepreneur. He built this business that uh, was really a series of relationships that he had with developers all over the country. And he'd never really organized it as a company. And so part of the joy that I had was to really try to create an enterprise, an enduring enterprise out of this amazing entrepreneur. And uh, so that was a great uh, decision. I left in the mid eighties to really go on and do kind of my own thing. I moved to California and the company started to run into trouble and they asked me to come back uh, as the CEO. And it was a turnaround. It was a very tough turnaround. We kind of got it there. Uh, we made a lot of changes. I think that but probably the big mistake I made was actually going back. I think I, 
I ended up uh, commuting. I'd, I'd leave it Sunday night at midnight on the red eye flight. And then I'd work all week in uh, Dallas, fly home on Friday night, spend the weekend with the kids and my wife, and then fly back out. So I did that for a couple of years. That was, that was a tough decision all around. Wow. That sounds like a, a very busy schedule. Yeah, it was tough. Trimble Crow, <laughs> the man himself, seemed like a really interesting guy. And I know he used to say, uh, the best time to give a Christmas ham is in October, not December. Can you tell the audience what he meant by that? Yeah, I mean, he said, you know, his sense was you always want to be building relationships. The ability to network, you know, a lot of business gets done through networking. And if you give a Christmas ham at Christmas, it's going to get lost with a hundred other cards and gifts and everything else. So give it in October when it stands out. <laughs> <laughs> so he was always doing favors. To people. I mean, it sounds a little calculating uh -huh. when I say it like that, but actually it was really genuine. Uh, one time I had gone to a, uh, uh, on a thing with him, a camp out, I think, and he was wearing uh, this uh, digital watch, which were kind of new at the time. And I said, let me see that, Trammel. That looks really cool. And I looked at it. And I said, man, that's really a cool thing. On Monday morning, when I got in to the office, there was a brand new digital watch sitting on my desk <laughs> from having that, made that comment. And uh, so I said, shoot, I should have admired his car. <laughs> <laughs> and to clarify joel when you were the ceo of trammel crow it was the largest commercial real estate development company in the world right private real estate development company in the world a developer and investor in real estate yeah okay okay and i know you've also been involved with a ton of startups in a lot of different ways i'm curious about the mindset of a ceo do you think the mindset of a CEO is different in uh, a super, super large company? Like the mindset and focus of a CEO is different than that of a CEO that is founding a company or growing a very small startup? I wouldn't say different. I would say augmented. Um, there are things that you have to worry about in a large company and certainly in a public company that you don't have to worry about in a small company. Likewise, there are things you have to worry about in a small startup you don't really have to think about it in a large company. Uh, okay. But the ability to attract the team, to see around corners, to make decisions under conditions of uncertainty, uh, I think all of those really are the same. So there's a huge overlap, but there are some significant differences. And I think that's a great transition to my next topic, which is based around Bonobos, which I think a lot of our audience has heard of and your experience, your experience with their co-founder and CEO, Andy Dunn. I gotta say, before I jump in the question, I'm a huge fan. I actually have three suits from Bonobos and I live in San Francisco and there's like a guide shop about two blocks away. And before this conversation, I listened to the Guy Raz interview with Andy Dunn um, on his show called How I Built This, which Joel, you were mentioned multiple times throughout, <laughs> that, uh, throughout that podcast. And I know you also mentioned Andy in your book. One thing I'm really curious about is, I know he was your student, and I know prior to Bonobos, he had an idea for South African beef jerky called Biltong. Was that, what did you not like about that idea? Because I know you were um, heavily persuading to, uh, him to go in another direction than Biltong. Well, so it's a funny story. I. Uh... His first year, I agreed to sponsor an independent study. Uh, and they did, he and a number of students did a wonderful job analyzing the market. But I think he was really serious about importing biltong into the United States. And I had just bought a uh, salty uh, snack food company. And I learned from that that uh, I lived or died based on how Frito Lay felt about me. And if they wanted to put us out of business, they could put us out of business in a week. And if they were happy to have us also on the shelf, then we lived. And I thought, I don't want to live that way. And so I, I pulled San Andy aside and I said, Andy, uh, I'm going to give you an H for this project, which is the highest grade mm -hmm. uh, for the project that you just did. But I'm going to also give you some advice, which is do not import Biltong. <laughs> <laughs> were there any similarities that you noticed between Andy Dunn and the founder of JetBlue, David Neeleman? Yeah, very much so. In fact, uh, 
it's a funny thing. I, I mentioned this in the book that uh, when Andy came in to present this idea to me, he, in fact, he, he came in to see me after he graduated, stopped in by my office and said, uh, I think I found what I want to do. And I said, well, tell me what it is, Andy. And he said, uh, it's not in Port Biltong, but I'm going to sell pants over the Internet, men's pants over the Internet. And I thought, oh, my gosh, this is even dumber than Biltong. <laughs> and so I thought, you know, how do you how do you respond to a student? I mean, you love these students. I I, I think the world of Andy. And so I, I wanted to help him. And I thought the best thing I can do is just say, why don't you make your presentation to me? Because I invest in a lot of uh, businesses and listen to students and coach them. So why don't you present to me? And then I could be able to nudge him away from it. And about, uh, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes into it, I thought, oh, my gosh, this reminds me of David Neeleman, who's the founder of JetBlue, uh, who's really, I think, the greatest uh, commercial airline entrepreneur in history and a fantastic guy. And uh, everybody said, you know, never invest in an airline. Well, I've now done three airlines with investing with David Neeleman. He's that fantastic. And so I thought, well, with Andy, what he's saying uh, really is so compelling that I said, well, you know what, I'm going to provide the seed, some of the seed capital for this. So I invested and then another professor uh, matched my investment and then he raised about as much from student friends of his. And that was the original seed capital to get Bonobo, Bonobos launched. At one point in the company's growth, you were ready to sell your shares. Can you talk about why you were ready to sell well, I wasn't really as ready to sell as uh, what happened was Andy was ready to raise the next round and okay. uh, came to me and said, would you be willing to re-up? And I said, of course. And then I was somewhere, I was off on a trip or something, and I came back and somebody said, oh, well, the pr he increased the price by 50%. And I said, no, that's not how I do business. Uh, so I'll just pass on this round. Mm -hmm. and of course, that that's devastating to an entrepreneur when one of your original investors pulls out. So I said, well, I'll just pass. And then I said, well, I'll sell at a discount to the other investors to make it easy on you. But more than anything, I was trying to teach Andy that his the phenomenal growth he'd had, if he priced everything based on that, he was going to get himself on a curve that would be impossible to meet over the... So I said, think long term, think about round, the B round, C round, D round, and mm -hmm. then going public or selling or doing whatever. And so I sat out around in, in that net net. Um, and then he invited me to come onto the board after that. And I reinvested and, you know, it all worked out well. But there was this moment in time where I was trying to coach him in a gentle way. And, uh, and we just couldn't come to terms. After listening to the podcast with Guy Raz, you clearly had an impact on him um, when you had the the conversations and emails with him uh, after that round of funding. Was there what, at what point did you join the board of Bonobos? It was uh, when they went to raise the next round. Okay, they were getting to a size, and they recognized that I had had. Uh, I think I've served on three dozen boards or something like that, and I've seen companies all the way from tiny new startups all the way through a couple of public companies. Uh, including taking companies public. So I think Andy felt like if they were on this journey, it might be helpful to have somebody like me sit on the board uh, as a part of it. So I came on at that point in time. And just so everyone knows, to finish the Bonobo story out, they, they were purchased in 2017 by Walmart for $310 million. So a massive success there. And Joel, when we talk about boards um, and companies having boards of directors. A lot of folks in my industry have smaller companies and they haven't even put together a formal board of directors. Is there a certain point in the growth of a company when someone should consider putting in a formal board of directors or should they have one from the word go? Well, there's a number of break points, <clears throat> excuse me, to consider. I, I actually think that early on, when you're just getting started, probably your, your investors represent kind of an informal board. In other words, they're often there are people with experience that you can go to and get advice and in a kind of a casual informal way. And I think that's fine. 
for a while. There may come a time when you want to formalize a board of advisors. A board of advisors is different from a board of directors. They don't have the legal responsibilities and you don't have the same uh, need to have a cadence and a regularity and a, and a kind of a, a way that's formalized. So a board of advisors can actually be helpful uh, where you can probably reach outside of your investors and that can take you to another level. Getting a board of directors really means you are accountable. As the CEO, as the founder, you basically have to report in to them and they can give advice. And depending on the, the bylaws, they may have control over certain things. Once you go public, then there are lots and lots of rules and regulations and um, there are required committees, there are required reporting, there's a certain cadence. Um, and for some people, it's too much. For others, it's a discipline that's helpful. I think when you get to a certain size and sophistication, uh, it's really helpful. In fact, I've encouraged a number of private companies to act as if they were public, to create the committees that a public company would have, et cetera, to assign somebody as a lead director or as even as chairman. Uh, so the CEO isn't, when you have a chairman CEO who's also the founder, often it can become quite autocratic. And that can often get in the way of really developing best practices, et cetera. So I think there are these stages to think about the development of the board. When you're looking for the right people to put on that formal board of directors, is there a way that you'd give advice to people about going about um, recruiting the right individuals to put on the board? Yes, I think there's a lot to it. Uh, you, want, you want people who both will hold you accountable who have the courage to hold you accountable, as well as the willingness to help, you know, to pitch in, to make introductions. So it's it's at once kind of a cheerleading, coaching, help uh, group, as well as somebody who then says, Is, who's your dad? <laughs> who comes in and says, okay, tell me what you did this past weekend. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you want both of those characteristics. You want people that you trust and who trust you. Um, you want people that uh, really have an interest in developing a great company. One of the things I say is always a little bit of a risk is when you have investors, sometimes investors are funds, uh, private equity or venture funds or whatever. And often they have a certain life. And a lot of those people are looking, their interest, their biggest interest is in the performance of that fund. And, their, and the life of that fund determines uh, somewhat their decision-making. If they have two years left on the fund, they're gonna be making a bunch of short-term decisions that may not be in the best interest of the company. So I think, uh, I always say that uh, board members, money has faces and those faces are the board members' faces and they will actually determine in many cases what who, who they should, who should come on the board. Um, um, so I, I think it's an important thing. I think boards can actually advance uh, a company's success or it can destroy a company. I've seen boards do both. So getting the right thing. And then I, and then I think the, um, the relationships, the comedy uh, between board members, they are a team. They're one of your teams. They're one of your more important teams. And I, so I think they take time. They take conversations. They take working together. I think getting a good chairman or lead director or whatever is important because that person will actually maintain a lot of the relationships with other board members and bring the best out in them. So I, th I think board structure, board meeting structure, agendas, understandings, norms, getting all those things set up thoughtfully is uh, often underestimated by entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And it's quite important. I was definitely taking notes as I was going through uh, that specific section in your book because uh, we're having some board development with our own company. And for those that are listening, in Joel's book, I mean, he talks about everything from um, how to sell to raising capital to negotiating uh, to talking about the major characteristics that a, a leader should embody to self-talk. So really highly recommend the book to anyone that's listening. And a lot of what you talk about, Joel, is how a leader can be most effective. How would you define an entrepreneurial leader? So I describe uh, the characteristics of a, an entrepreneurial leader in um, categories of, you know, they have to have political abilities, they have to have managerial abilities, they have to have entrepreneurial abilities. 
so that it's it's kind of what I call the the five skill player that uh, baseball teams look for. You know, somebody who can uh, hit, run, hit for average, hit for power, run, uh, throw, field, et cetera. So in any event, that's kind of the model is that you have to have a bunch of these different things. But the most important thing entrepreneurs do is really drill these foundational peers all the way to bedrock, which is what I talk about in the book. You know, you have to build trust. And uh, so you have to be a trusted person. You have to be trustworthy. You have to know your own operating system. You have to communicate effectively. You have to do all the things that nurture trust. Then you basically you have to have clarity around a mission. In other words, what are you we trying to achieve together? And by the way, that's always sounds simple and people want to skip over it. I would challenge almost anyone to think about developing a great mission that inspires others that they own. And that doesn't mean the entrepreneur can sit in uh, his or her room and come up with a mission and that's it. They need to share it. They need to wordsmith it. Everybody needs to own the mission. And then they have to bring on a team, you know. Uh, so you've asked, you know, what does an entrepreneur need to do? And I'm giving you several things because I think really it's it's in building this great foundation that you're able to erect a wonderful superstructure. And so then getting the right team on board, which means sourcing the right people, interviewing them, onboarding them, coaching them, promoting them, demoting them, and ultimately be willing, being willing to let them go. And, you know, if you're going to keep the best team on the field at all times, you have to sit some people down and you have to trade some people. And that's just the reality of it. So they have to be able to do that well. And then the last uh, peer to drill is this execution step. You, you need to be able to really execute on these most serious things. And so I list 10 of them that really you need to be able to do really well. But I think it's it's really quite a simple map. If you think about it, it's, it's hard to execute. It's hard to change your own operating system. It's hard to come up with a mission statement. It's hard to find and onboard and coach and listen to a team, you know, to build on the best team. And it's hard to execute to perfection. But the map, it's helpful to me to have the map and to have some coaching, some best practices. May I say one other thing about that, uh, Pat? Uh, I know I've gone on a little bit long on that uh, oh, question fine. that should have been simple, but I, I learned uh, at JetBlue this um, notion of having kind of a checklist. I, I would sit in the uh, cockpit with pilots from time to time and watch them go over a checklist. And some of these people had flown planes for a quarter of a century. They knew everything. So why did they need a checklist? Well, there was something about going through and making sure that you'd thought through all this stuff. So I thought about this idea of, well, what if we had a checklist for the entrepreneur who was really trying to build a, uh, an enduring enterprise, a company that would last, you know, beyond a profitable business, but really a great institution. What if they had a checklist? So that's what I tried to think through and just give best practices, coaching, and get it all written down in one place so it would be helpful to entrepreneurs. I, I, I found it to be super valuable. Um, when it comes to a given person being the leader of the organization, being the entrepreneurial leader, do you think anybody can be an entrepreneurial leader or do you think some are born with innate qualities, you know, and once they have the map, they're ready to go? How do you feel about um, if anybody can fit into that role as the entrepreneurial leader? Well, I think everybody can get a lot better at developing the skills around it. Um, I, I'm not a believer in that leaders are to the manner born, you know, that they they either come with the charisma that allows them to be a leader or they're, they can't do it. I've seen a lot of people develop who didn't start out as being somebody you think could lead an organization who have actually through practice, you know, it's Malcolm Gladwell that talks about the 10,000 hours that you need to become expert at anything. So I think, uh, I think I, I was able to get a lot better at basketball, but I think it would never have been possible for me to be LeBron James or mm. Steph Curry or mm. anybody who really has the natural ability. So I think there's, there's something that pe some people are uh, come to the table with that gives them a leg up. That's not to say that somebody couldn't, you know, I mean, somebody, I, I, I look at a Steve Nash or somebody in basketball who was a phenomenal and he was a little guy. And so I'm a little white guy, you know, could <laughs> I have gotten that? I guess, maybe not, but I think I could have gotten a lot better 
uh-huh. by following the the rules. So I, I, I'm kind of a both minds on that. That's so funny. I totally agree. I played high school basketball. I got cut from my J or excuse me, from my varsity team, my junior year, Steve Nash was huge at the time. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little white guy as well. And so I was like <laughs> trying to figure out, so I was like modeling everything, my game after him and I ended up making the team, uh, senior <laughs> year. So I totally agree with your analogy there. Um, one big point in your book that also stood out to me was the way to go about firing somebody. And unfortunately I've, I've had to go through this process in the last 10 years, a few times. And, uh, I really liked the way that you uh, gave people kind of a, a very simple process as to how to do it. Can you talk about the best approach to firing somebody? I think a lot of it starts with mindset. You know, a lot of people wait until they're just so angry that the anger allows them to fire them. So they're operating from emotion. And I think it's, you know, there's no reason for that to be. In fact, uh, Harvard Business Review wrote an article uh Actually, I wrote the article, but they published it. They interviewed me and then published it. Um, that was, I think, April or May, March, April of 2020, I think. Uh, but it's about how to fire people elegantly or with empathy or whatever. And so I think the starting point comes from feeling this is an important person. I care about this person. I want the best thing for them. And working here is not the best for them. It's not the best for the company. Therefore, it can't be the best for them. Therefore, I want to help them get on with their lives in a better way. And so I think um, not being obscure about it, you need to let people know, I've decided to make a decision. We're going to be moving you on to a new life. We are going to help you in the following ways. You've got health insurance. Uh, You can have an office here. We'll help you with uh, outplacement will help with this, that, and the other. Here's what I will say in a recommendation, you know? And so you, I'm not, if they're, if they were fired because they're never in on time, I'm not going to talk about their punctuality, but I'll say they are good at the following. So let them know that, but move them on out and make, be decisive about it. It's not in their interest. It's not in your interest, but that doesn't mean they're a bad person. Think of them as an alumnus, mm-hmm. you know, you are going to have alumni from your organization. And by the way, you may later hire them. You may later work for them. You may later work with them, or they may work for somebody who is either a competitor or a friend. So think longitudinally, Mm -hmm. Uh, but you have to make the decision and you shouldn't doubt. Don't wait around until you're upset or angry. I have one entrepreneur that I work with that uh, she says um, that her approach has always been, I love you. I love you. I love you. Get out of here. You know, it's just, she waits. She waits until she just can't stand it anymore. And then, uh-huh. and then shoots. So she's learned from that. But mm-hmm. that's a tendency a lot of people have, is to wait until there's an offense. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think that's necessary. I think you give feedback along the way. You give performance improvement uh, notions. You are transparent. Um, I, I would never do an. I, I, well, I, I was about to say I'd never do an annual performance review. I think annual performance reviews are great. And you should do those. But if that's the only feedback you give to somebody, you're really not being fair. I used to pull people aside after meetings, you know, and just say, may I talk to you? May I give you some coaching on this? Or may I, may I give you my impression of what went on? Mm-hmm. They never say no. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, if you say, may I give you this? That just shows respect. Mm-hmm. You respect them. And so you're just saying, may I give you some feedback? And say, you might think about Mm-hmm. And then they've actually been put on notice that something is an issue and they either work on it or they don't. Mm-hmm. And you can say, you know, I noticed that we're not making any improvement in this. It's something getting in your way. Mm-hmm. So this is the coaching phase. And sometimes uh, the coaching phase can last, you know, six or eight or 10 months uh, before you do it. But sometimes it's, you really know within a very, fairly short period of time. I like the way you break that down because I also think that by, communicating regularly and giving feedback regularly and giving it politely builds the habit of doing it regularly. So you just get used to doing it. Uh, people get used to hearing from you. And I think, uh, a lot of times, at least leaders that I've experienced have, um, been under communicators. Yeah. So, yeah. and I've also early in my career, I think I fell into the trap of over explaining when I was in a firing situation and learning to be direct 
and um, kind of move through the agenda that we laid out was really helpful for me uh, as I well, went on. So one other thing there, Pat, that I, I forgot to mention, the, the actual meeting where you let somebody go, there should be no explaining. Mm -hmm. It should never have been a surprise to somebody. You should have been processing things along the way so that you're never shocking somebody with it. And then the purpose of the meeting is just to say, we're, we need to make a, a deal. This is to help you get on with your life. And this is to help the company get on. And here are the, here's the transaction. So you're no longer, you're, you're beyond explaining at that point in time, if you do it right. In my industry, Joel, there's negotiations that are happening all the time and negotiations are in my world. And I think in, in the majority of the business world, very different from the way that Hollywood portrays them. What is the right mindset to have when you enter a negotiation? Well, I think a lot of people do think they go in with the Hollywood mindset and they think it's there's a winner and a loser. Somebody has more power and they come out with the uh, with the fruits of the negotiation and somebody's a loser and they go up with their tail between their legs. I like to think of a negotiation as a conversation and it's a conversation with somebody I respect and I want us both to win. So uh, that doesn't mean that I'm going to lose in order that the other party win, but I want them to come away with what they wanted out of the thing with me winning at the same time. I know what uh, I've got is worth and I'm, I want to be paid a fair amount for it. So I'm solving for fairness. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's the, almost the difference between saying, I want to have a lot of negotiations with this person. I want it to be uh, this discussion to be part of a series, not a single hit. And I think you develop a reputation of being a fair person, a reasonable negotiator, somebody who shares facts and who solves for good outcomes. Um, and, and I think that's a better way to go about your negotiating life than to say, this is a killer negotiator. He mm -hmm. storms out, he makes sure that he that you wait on him, uh -huh. uh, that, you know, just all the techniques, there's lots of techniques that people have written about and that you see in these Hollywood depictions. Mm -hmm. uh, my experience is this is a person that I like and respect and I want to have a future negotiation with, but I'm not going to, okay, I know and what that means is you not only have to know your position, but you kind of have to know their BATNA too. You have to be, you have to think through what the uh, BATNA means, the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. So you want to understand, you know, what are your options? What are their options? And then let's solve for a solution that works for both of us. And it's one conversation in a very long narrative. That, like for, for my industry, we're negotiating on different deals every day. And so if we were to play the game of I win, you lose, it's, it's going to have an extremely negative effect on the relationship. So It'll I- It'll come back to bite you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. When we talk about uh, communication, Joel, is there an area, I know this is a pretty general question, but is there an area where leaders fail when it comes to communication and um, how can they, they improve if they're experiencing that failure? Well, I think all leaders are somewhat deficient and it just sort of depends on, you know, what they're not doing well. So I, I think there are a lot of things that uh, where people, uh, communicate inadequately. I think the most common one is not being good listeners. You know, a lot of times by the time you get to high up in an organization, you have people protecting you. Uh, you have a lot of pressures on you. And so this idea of listening and capturing what another person is saying and really seeing behind the words and to understand what it is they're saying, I think that's an area that all of us need work on. Mm -hmm. But I think particularly people that make it to the C-suite, a lot of times they find themselves not very good. They find themselves as giving direction from on high. The corner office speaks. And uh, that, that can be heady, but it can also alienate a bunch of people. And I think we should be uh, doing a good chunk of listening. Listening is also influencing. And you know this from your business that a lot of the great salespeople are the great listeners. They're the great people who... Mm -hmm. who are the great, the great um, salespeople uh, listen to capture what the issue is or the problem is another party and then solves that problem. 
And that's mm-hmm. communication. Mm-hmm. It's just they're not talking when they're doing it. They're just they're, they're understanding. And I think that's that's probably the area. If you had me to define one element of communicating mm-hmm. that I think leaders struggle with a little bit. Well said. I've seen so many first time salespeople fail in that specific arena because they're not able to identify the issue or the specific point that the, sp- the prospect is trying to get at or bring up or re- and a lot of times they're the, the prospect is really trying to reveal the issue that they're experiencing it. And if there's a salesperson that's not listening, you know, they're essentially just reciting the, the sales pitch that they've, they've practiced. So I'm definitely with you on that one. And Joel, I have one more question before, uh, like a series of rapid fire questions from our audience. And this final question is something everybody in the business world experiences on a daily basis, but the big topic of meetings. And I know you go into detail on, in this on your book, but what is the best way to run a meeting? <laughs> yeah, so I could write a book about it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I think there are several rules that have been captured by a number of other people, but I, th- I think, um, you know, I always say, hold your meetings early in the morning, hold them early in the week, not late in the day or late in the week. Uh, so timing matters. The room matters. Having refreshments matter. Breaks matter. So those are all of the kind of mm. physical characteristics. But the most important thing is really the agenda and the people. You know, what are you covering? What decisions are you making? Is this a brainstorming meeting? Is this a decision-making meeting? Is this a a regular meeting where we have to check the box? I mean, what's the nature of the meeting? And then who all is there? I don't like meetings where there are audiences, where you say, okay, everybody come because they'll feel bad if they're not there, Mm -hmm. or where they're pure presentations. I think you want to, even in a board meeting, you want it to be rolling up your sleeves, taking on an issue or on a problem. Now there are elements of the other that have to go along. There's housekeeping matters, but the essence, the core of the meeting should be, here's an issue. Let's ventilate it. Let's talk about it. Not present it by one person. You of course have to do that. But then the real heart is getting people to weigh in, to discuss. I've even cold called as chairman. I'll call on somebody and just say, Sam, what do you think about uh, that point? Or how do you react to that, Susan? And, uh, and so you get, you, you pull them in. I used to tell my students that, uh, or actually when I would train other teachers uh, at Stanford, I would say, you know, get your, all of your students to make a noise within the first three sessions, first three class sessions, then they'll own the class. Once they've heard their voice, they put a stake in the ground, they own it. It's their class. And um, if they don't, they will withdraw and become quiet. It's the same in a board meeting. You know, make sure people are talking, they're engaged, et cetera. And then I like to have assignments come out of the meeting. We decided the following things. There's a follow-up item. And I'd like to begin the next meeting with the follow-up items from the last one. So it feels like this is a series. These are daisy-chained. Um, these meetings connect one to another. And so I think that's a good discipline. There's a bunch of checklist kinds of disciplines that I note in the book, but those are some of the ones that stand out for me uh, as having been helpful. I appreciate you putting those checklists together for the audience and for anyone that reads your book, because in my experience, a lot of times people set meetings with very little thought, with very little planning, with, you know, they want to make everyone feel good by getting everyone in the room and making everyone feel like they have a voice, but if people aren't contributing or if people don't have the right attitude going into it, or, you know, if people don't want to be there, you're not really setting yourself up for success. So I I think uh, if you were to interview people about how they feel about meetings, it is highly negative. I mean, it is, you know, this notion of a net promoter score. If you were to assign net promoter scores to meetings, they would get some of the lowest scores of any of the processes that go on. And that's largely because people violate all the rules. And you, you know yourself, you've come out of a meeting saying, what a waste of time. Totally. Oh my God, I was bored to tears. Why didn't we move on? What did, and I think having, so you have to have somebody that directs it, that calls the issue, that makes the assignment, that says, hey, I'm glad I'm here. This is really relevant to my life and to what I'm doing. Glad I knew that. You know, so everybody's really involved 
And that's a skill. And it, and you know, like you say, Pat, it takes some preparation. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to think about it ahead of time. This idea, let's just get together and talk about it. By the way, there are times when that's helpful, but I would say that most of that time, they should be standing meetings and they should be explicitly that. Say, guys, I thought we'd just huddle together this morning and talk about Mm -hmm. this thing. Let's just brainstorm. We're not going to make any decisions, but we're going to brainstorm about this. And so people know going in, okay, Mm -hmm. I can throw out ideas. Mm -hmm. People don't know. You know, when they go into a meeting, they don't know. Is it, are we making decisions? Am I going to be held accountable? Am I being evaluated in this? Is this, uh, you know, what is this meeting? And you would be amazed at how many times people are confused about that. So I like to be really explicit. This is a meeting we're going to decide on. I mean, we we had one I remember at JetBlue that was about cybersecurity, which relates to oh, yeah. what you had. Cool. Okay. Let's do a tabletop exercise, uh-huh. you know, and it got uh-huh. real. Uh-huh. People were engaged. And so that's what we were about. Okay, thanks. That's over. Now we're going to move on to capital structure. Uh An expert, our treasurer is going to talk to us about capital structure. We've got a banker coming in. We're not going to make any decisions this time, but I want you all to go away and think about that. And we're going to come back and talk about our debt load or whatever. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, for the the pre-meeting checklist and for the checklist with almost every element of business, the listeners can um, check out Joel Peterson's book, Entrepreneurial Leadership. I highly recommend it. It's something I'm going to have in my office just in case I'm ever in a situation where I feel like I need to review it. But to wrap up here, Joel, we have uh, five rapid fire questions, which you can answer, you know, as short or as long as you want. But uh, I think you'll find they're pretty personal, pretty playful questions. Um, So we know that you went to Harvard for your MBA, but you're a professor at Stanford. Who do you root for when Harvard plays Stanford? Stanford. How come? Uh, I have uh, three kids and a daughter-in-law who all went to Harvard Business School. So there's kind of a little bit, and they got into, some of seven, several of them got into Stanford. Uh-huh. So I feel protective of my turf. I'm the only one, <laughs> only family member that, that can claim uh, Stanford. Uh, and I, yeah. I like the Stanford uh, approach and feeling and spirit and size mm-hmm. and everything. So Harvard's better known and bigger and mm-hmm. very powerful. Mm-hmm. And I had a wonderful experience there, but I root for Stanford. Okay. All right. Did you have a favorite role in your career, whether it's CEO, CFO, board member, or teacher? Is there, is there a role that you enjoyed most? My favorite role in life is father. Uh, and I know that's not on your list. But <laughs> no worries. I'm I'm now 74 years old. And when you get to be my age, a lot more of your life is behind you than ahead of you. Mm. So you're able to sift through all the experiences and think about them. And there's nothing like being a parent. All I right. think uh, sometimes people sacrifice uh, too much um, of parenting in order to have a spectacular career. And I actually think you can combine both. And when you get to be my age, you'll look back on it and it will be those relationships that you have with children uh, that will be your legacy. That's awesome. Joel, do you have a favorite restaurant in Salt Lake City? I've just developed one uh, called Cafe Madrid, which is a little tiny uh, Spanish uh, restaurant that's in the neighborhood. Okay, cool. I, I, I have a trip in a few weeks, I think. Uh... I'm I'm interested to check it out. Cafe yeah, Madrid. Should. Spanish food? Yeah, Spanish food. Okay. And it's fantastic. It's amazing. I didn't know there was such a thing as Spanish food. I spent <laughs> several years in France. And okay. the French are phenomenal with food, but they also think they're the best in the world at it. <laughs> <laughs> are there any books that you are reading at the moment? Yeah, I'm actually reading American Marxism right now. Um, uh, so by uh, Mark Levin. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a story that is off the political uh-huh. thing. That, that's fairly political. But uh, the, at one of my birthday parties, uh, the kids organized and then had my grandkids there. And they had, much like you're doing, 10 questions about grandpa. Mm-hmm. 
And one of the questions they asked was, what's grandpa's favorite book? And you would think no grandkid is going to have any idea what grandpa's favorite book uh-huh. is. And most of them got it right, you know, and it was called A Short History of Nearly Everything by Bill Bryson, which is a fantastic book. Oh, Bryson great. is a wonderful author. Uh-huh. But that book to me really got my arms around all kinds of things. We have a story behind how do we know about, you know, this, that, or the other in life. And it's, it was an amazing book. I will have so, to check that out. I'm, I'm glad yeah, that you recommended sure. it. And then final question for you, Joel, what are you most excited about this summer? You know, the summer's, uh, so this, I don't know whether I'm excited about this or not, but uh, they, uh, when I retired it as chairman of JetBlue, they named the plane after me that will be our first flight to London. No way. So, That's yeah. so cool. So uh, on August 11th, they're flying, uh, they're having the kind of the ribbon cutting naming ceremony. So I'm going back to New York for that. And if there weren't a lockdown in London right now where you had to be quarantined after that, then I would fly to London on that plane on its virgin uh, journey uh, to London. But right. that's kind of exciting. That's a one time in forever thing. I'm uh, Condi Rice, uh, the former Secretary of State, oh, yeah. is the director of the Hoover Institution where I was chairman. And I, when that happened, I dropped Condi a note uh, because she had mentioned in her autobiography that they had named, a, I think, a 400,000 ton tanker after her. And I said, this beats what happened to you, Condi. <laughs> <laughs> she agreed. Much more elegant. <laughs> so that flight is happening on August 11th for sure from New York to London? Well, I don't know anything's for sure with the world. Yeah, yeah, with the regulations. But if, if all goes uh, in a positive direction, that's when it should go down. It could could well be. Yeah, yeah at least the ribbon cutting is then. Oh, cool, cool. I the, I ask because I know that um, we are excited to go visit our our partners at London that are uh-huh. are associated with Lloyd's of London, and so we have to do that. New York to London flight. So if they're selling tickets, who knows? Maybe in ideally well, things open love, up. I mean, if, if not this flight, take it at another time. You will love the JetBlue experience. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. I'm excited. I'm excited in California and uh, my brother's in SoCal. So I feel like, I, and I went to Loyola Marymount University. So I've done so much travel to Southern California and the Southwest, but I would love to um, fly JetBlue, especially after reading the book, especially after hearing, I, I know David Neeleman also has a podcast on how I built this with Guy Raz, which was great as yeah. well. Yeah. David's phenomenal. Yeah. And uh, we actually backed him in Azul down in, um, in Brazil. Brazil. And then again, he just launched an, another airline in the United States called Breeze. And, wow. And uh, we were the launch investor in that. We love the guy. The guy is a maverick. It's like yeah. every time I hear about him, there's a new airline popping up. Yeah, he's amazing. Well, Joel Peterson, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate the insight. And uh, I, if, there, if you're ever in San Francisco, would love to catch up. And uh, I hope to talk to you again soon. Good. I look forward to it, Pat. All right. Thanks, Joel. Today's podcast is sponsored by First Insurance Funding. First is the leading premium finance company in insurance and is known throughout the industry for their personalized service and quote flexibility. If you're tired of sending quote requests for smaller premiums to multiple companies, not leaving enough time to negotiate larger deals, then choose first as your premium financing source and experience the first difference today. 